Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for having me here for this presentation. I'm new to this group. I'm an outsider, if you like. But um, after the first uh, talks that I've had, I don't feel I'm in the wrong place at all. And I'm really curious what uh, the next uh, discussions uh, will bring and uh, how we'll get to understand one another. The subject that's been suggested is to synchronicity and quantum entanglement. Following in the footsteps of the dialogue of Wolfgang Pauli and C.G. Young. Well, telepathy, clairvoyance, psychokinesis, precognition, and, and other so called paranormal or anomalous the phenomena um, are often uh, taken as object of the cultural sciences in our economic environment. They're the same quality as fairy tales, shamanic rituals, or magic tricks of the modern entertainment culture. But if um, you wanted to, to discuss them as real events, or even consider them as an object uh, of uh, natural scientific understanding, well, that is almost forbidden by a far-reaching worldview of naturalism, which is a de-ideologized form of uh, materialism. Uh, many people feel that uh, in our world, everything will, went according to the laws of nature. This is what many people claim. And there are even organizations who agitate against any departure from this world view. There are other critics who say that uh, the nat naturalist world view is a view that was definitely uh, born yesterday. And uh, many people um, say, um, that uh, the paranormal is, as Morgenstern saw it, that which must not, cannot be. Now, in the, 20, in the uh, 20s of the last century, um, there was a situation which was quite embarrassing, even in today's slide. A young physicist called Wolfgang Pauli upset his colleagues in the Physical Institute of the University of Hamburg with his psychokinetic energy. Equipment and device would break when he was present, or experiments would fail altogether. What's quite remarkable, and uh, that is even talked about today sometimes, what's remarkable is that uh, what you find in Wikipedia. It says, Pauli was notorious among experimental physicists uh, for his two left hands. Yes, even they argued, and they were only half joking, that if only he were present, lab devices would immediately fail. Well, uh, the uh, well-known experimental physicist, Otto Stern, was uh, absolutely not joking when he banned Pauli from his Hamburg laboratory in order to protect his equipment. And Pauli himself, and you'll remember that he was awarded a Nobel Prize, investigated his own psychokinetic abilities very carefully. And they provide the background of the dialogue with the Swiss doctor and uh, psychologist C. D. Young that we're dealing with today here. Wolfgang Pauli was born in Vienna in 1900, and he is one of the pioneers of quantum physics. He is considered one of the greatest geniuses of his time. In 1926, he received a professorship in Hamburg, and in 1928, he was called to Zurich as a professor. And then 
primarily pri uh, private reasons took him to Jung in the first place. Carl Gustav Jung, born in Kessville in Switzerland in 1875, had been a professor in Zurich since 1950. He later on moved to Baal. Uh, had been a friend of Sigmund Freund, Freud uh, for a couple of years, but then he broke with Freud because he felt uh, Freud um, was too much fixated on libido in his uh, definition of sexuality. And uh, C.G. Young uh, then created in his analytical psychology a concept of men which, which was deeply rooted in cultural traditions and uh, behavioral patterns. And he created his uh, therapy of individuation on this basis. He had a universal education. And uh, in fact, Albert Einstein um, was a frequent visitor to Young's uh, when Pauli was still at school. In the beginning, of the 30s, Pauli had a life crisis, and this is why he went to Young uh, to undergo treatment. Well, treatment uh, was delegated uh, to, an, to an intern of his, Anna Rosenbaum. But uh, then he decided that he still wanted to talk with Pauli, but they would discuss uh, the foundations of the relationship of mind and matter. And fortunately, at least a part of this uh, dialogue uh, was in the form of letters. And since 1992, we've had these in print edited by C.A. Meyer. Wolfgang Pauli and C.G. Young, co correspondence, 1932 to 1958. And in 1958, Pauli uh, died from cancer at an early age, you'd say. Well, uh, this treasure trove of corresponding uh, has not been thoroughly investigated yet. In 1995, Atmansbacher et al. Um, published a volume based on a symposium, and there were um, highly interesting contributions in it. Uh, it's called the Paul Young Dialogue in its uh, importance for modern science. Um, for the rest, there are very few other publications on that. In 2001, uh, the correspondence was translated into English, and since then, uh, there have been uh, some English language books on Pauli and Young. And uh, just one example is this one uh, by the author uh, David Lindorf. I haven't read it myself, but uh, it is an example that I found quite interesting. I found it on the internet. Let us now turn to the heart of the matter. And let's uh, discuss the term of synchronicity as it played a role in the early young uh, discussion. Uh, C.A. Mayer, the editor of the correspondence, uh, calls synchronicity Jung's term for phenomena that coincide in time or in space where there is no causal explanation for the coincidence, but clearly a meaningful connection. They may occur between psyche and psyche, telepathically as it were, or between psyche and a physical body, i.e. outside in the physical reality, or psychokinetically. This is not a full de definition of synchronicity, but uh, this is how Mayer describes it in the beginning. And uh, then Mayer goes on to give an example uh, that uh, also like to read out. Polly uh, was sitting one afternoon or evening in Zurich in the Odeon Café, and he was mulling over his uh, functional insufficiencies, his emotions, uh, the color of red. That's uh, 
what he had gleaned from uh, his therapy. So he was uh, <laughs> mulling over his functional insufficiencies. And uh, outside, it said there was a large vehicle that was parked without anybody inside. And Paulie uh, just couldn't help himself. He could uh, do nothing but stare at the vehicle uh, when uh, the vehicle all of a sudden caught fire and burned in a blaze. And Maya calls that the Paulie effect. So, another uh, psychokinetic event, and Pauli was convinced that this was not an accident, that it didn't uh, catch fire accidentally. He was convinced of that. And Jung, in his memories, uh, tells the following synchronistic event. He woke up one night and uh, felt pain in the back of his head. And he didn't know where that came from. But a while later, he learns that uh, a former patient of his had uh, just in that moment shot himself dead. And um, the bullet uh, went through the head and got stuck in the back of his head, a synchronistic event. So uh, both gentlemen had experience with uh, what they then went on to discuss at a more abstract level. So synchronicity was something that both were very familiar with. The notion of synchronicity is closely coupled with what Jung calls archetypes. Those are structural dominants of the psyche, which are unconscious and innate. And they're experienced mainly in uh, symbolic images and dreams. But in synchronistic phenomena, they uh, go beyond that. And uh, there is an interesting quote, which uh, can be found in one letter of, from Jung to Pauli. And it says, the archetypes are ideas in the Platonic sense, on the one hand, archetypes, ideas. On the other hand, uh, they are directly linked to physiological processes. And in cases of synchronicity, they appear as arrangers of uh, physical circumstances so that they can also be seen as a property of the matter or uh, as a meaning of the same. Very interesting, I found. Now, you might comment that and say that the uh, Descartes abyss between mind and matter is bridged. There is something between the two. There's a, a new kind of reality, a tertiary one. In a synchronicity, uh, this new reality well, in, it, the new reality finds a, a special manifestation in this new reality. And uh, it uh, even gets its own archetype um, which is the psychoid, psychoid archetype. And the psychoid archetype is, is in line with um, the correspondence of Jung and uh, Pauli, because they wanted to find a neutral language to describe the relationship between mind and matter. They wanted to express that neither psychology nor physics uh, can describe uh, this reality properly. Extrasensory perception, as Jung says, are based on the psychoid uh, archetype, which in our experience can manifest itself both in physical as in psychological terms. Pauli and Jung knew that they could not solve the psychophysical problem. However, uh, they 
tried to stretch the envelope and uh, got into a boundary area which is still awaits investigation these days. Pauli, of course, being an astute physicist, uh, made sure uh, that notion and terms were reviewed and uh, clarified over and over again. And uh, he also likes to uh, criticize the term archetype. He never liked it. But at the same time, he agreed with Jung that uh, uh, causalistic uh, physics would, in principle, not be able uh, to understand the relationship between psyche, spirit, and matter. He moved himself into the dialogue with many dream events in order to move archetypical symbolism into the thinking process in an experience-rated way. He was very sharp-minded and also a theoretical physicist and was also really open to discussions regarding dream processes. You know, not just theory, but in combination with theory. And he was also writing a lot about this in the letters to Jung. He described his dreams and he also interpreted his dreams. To him, Pauli, and also to Jung, synchronicity was not just describing a phenomenon, it was a, an organizational principle imminent in nature that referred to meaningfulness and teleology. It combined mind and matter in such a way that neither mind could be derived from matter nor matter from mind. This principle, did it only always happen in combination of psyche and matter? Or could it also become visible just in reference to one of the two components? This was a question that Pauli asked himself, especially when looking for examples in quantum physics. He discussed with Zhang, for example, he discussed the question whether there could be more than just the obvious behind random radioactive decay. And Pauli, he died a pretty sudden death so that, you know, this dialogue could not be continued. It was left open. And now we've reached a point where we could say, well, this dialogue, was it continued in some way? And something really strange really happened. Even in the days of Pauli, in 1935, there was Einstein who had started a discussion. And it was independent of the discussions between Pauli and Jung, but it was focused on the same topic. It was all about another phenomenon, and Schrödinger later called it entanglement. And it certainly was related very much to synchronicity, but first, this was hardly basically observed by anybody. Only more recently than not, is the reference to the Pauli Jung dialogue actually picked up on? And entanglement is certainly gaining importance. You've certainly heard about this here in the introduction by Mr. Bischoff. And that's something that I think is really future oriented. And I'll go back to that later. And von Lukadu, Atmansbacher, and Römer, and Wallach, and others, all these scientists also played a role. You know, this was the idea. Quantum entanglement. It was all about finding out about the importance. The importance it has in many applications. And of course, quantum entanglement, and especially its characteristic, so-called non-locality, is not just touching upon the boundaries of physics, something that's not really important. It's not like that. 
This is certainly one of the most important factors, one of the most consequential discoveries of quantum physics of them all. The quantum computers, for instance, that's just one example. Like in cryptography, they do the computation billions of times better than most computers that you have today. And everybody's trying to develop them all over the world very rapidly. So you cannot actually say it's just philosophical or ideological, it's real. But it's not just engineering, not just technology. It's also all about our understanding, our concept of nature and life and mind and spirit and world and cosmos. It's also for all of this that this idea really matters. The idea, the notion of quantum entanglement. It's really of utmost importance. You can certainly consider it a key to intensified and more concrete continuation of the Paul Jung dialogue. It's certainly something that should be at the center of our future analysis, our future observation. And I just like to try to look at entanglement again along the lines of Einstein. It's used in different ways. And when you use this term, you really have to be careful. I'll just try and make it a little clearer. So let's go back to Einstein. He kept complaining all the time. He was notorious for that. He kept complaining about quantum theory, even though he had not been given the Nobel Prize for relativity theory, but for his contribution to quantum theory. But you know, he didn't like that, that the statistical law of probability fit his world view following Spinoza. And in 1935, he published a paper together with a physicist, Podolsky and Rosen, that was to shake up the validity, or at least the completeness, of quantum mechanics again. The theory was saying that it should be possible for two photons or two particles of matter could be entering into such a close combination with each other that even if they were far apart, light years apart, they would still stay related closely. If the quantum state of one gets changed, at the same time, the analogous state of the other particle will also change. And that's not in line with my theory of relativity. That's what Einstein is saying. The speed of light is the utmost speed there can be. So this is not possible. And Bohr is trying to calm him down, saying, well, this is just a theoretical discussion. And they then neglected it. But it seems like Pauli did not even perceive this discussion, or at least did not speak out on it. And that really first became interesting when it became interesting to use experiments to decide the question, do we have this synonym of quantum entanglement? Is it real? Or is quantum theory really false? That's an alternative that could first be decided by experiment after the death of Einstein and Pauli. Right. Just quickly on how it was proved to be true. A couple of more comments on detail, not just in general. Einstein called this the spooky action at a distance. It was all about an experiment. 
that could be used to prove it. And there was a young Irish physicist in the 60s, the 70s of the last century, came up with an idea, a physicist called John Bell. So-called Bell's inequations. Point of departure, a simple and logical idea. Following the Viennese physicist Zeilinger, let me use an everyday example to explain it. Imagine, imagine a gathering of human identical twins, a conference. Twins, identical twins, and for each twin we can identify whether the twin has blue or brown eyes, black or blonde hair, and according to a specified measure, we can define whether the twin is tall or not. We're meeting on a nicely flattened sandy ground in a circle. We had lots about circles today. Like think three large circles that intersect. And they're supposed to have a property. The property of if diagrams, like we heard at school. And we do some counting and we say the interior the inside of one circle, and here you can see that too. I've drawn it for you. That's for the blue-eyed twins and the outside for the brownie-eyed. And that's clear because you either have brown or blue eyes, and then black or blonde hair. So we don't want any mixed hair colored twins, we want a clear distinction, black or blonde hair, and also tall or not. And then we ask each twin to go to one of the fields created by the three circles, where all his features, all his characteristics are correct, are right, like the dark portion. This might be for all the twins that are blue-eyed, that have black hair, that's the right-hand circle also inside, and then that are small, outside of the circle for tall. Inside it's tall, outside it's small. And then that's a nice description, a nice illustration. And now, we do some counting. So we count the twins now. The twins that are blue-eyed and have black hair. And then, we we'll look at how many they are, and we we'll look at how many there are that are blue-eyed and tall, and black-haired and small. If you take the last two together, they will also include all those on the left-hand side. On the left-hand side, if you're on the left-hand side, you are included in the fields on the right-hand side. If you take the two portions that are dark on the left-hand side, you get something that's included in the left-hand side. And you can do some counting to create an in equation. Number of blue-eyed, black-haired twins is smaller or equal than the tall and blue-eyed twins plus the number of black-haired and small twins. So, that's an inequation, a bell type inequation. And Bell's inequation applies to all different kinds of objects or people. 
or anything else. It doesn't really have anything to do with quantum physics, first and foremost. It's just pure logic. But you can apply it. Instead of human twins, we're now looking at pairs of entangled photons. In a source Q, and here I'm drawing it for you again, it is simplified over what you really do in experiments. But anyway, in a source, we're assuming entangled twins that we generate one after the other, sent out in opposite directions for simplicity reasons, let them be polarized, and let them oscillate in the same level, which you can do in an experiment. And at the same distance from the source, there's two polarization filters that we put up, vertical on the direction of the photons, with slits and through the green one, or the red one, that's where the photons can go, following a certain principle. And we're counting. We're counting the photons. We're counting those that go through the green or the red slit. And then we also turn this by 30 degrees or 60 degrees. And now this is what we do. We just looked at the human twins. We just looked at that example. We had the color of the eyes and the color of the hair, and we had the body height. And we now replace that and look at positions of the polarization filters, 0, 30, and 60 degrees. And brown eyes and blue eyes, we replace that by the properties of the photon, of the polarized photon. The polarized photon will go through the green slit, and in the other case, it's going to go through the red slit, like with the filters at 30 or 60 degrees. So we're just applying the same approach here. And then we can also transfer Bell's in equation again. And now, that's what it looks like. And you remember the circles, right? Number of results, filter position zero, photon goes through the green slit, and now we're doing the first measurement on the right-hand polarization filter, and the second one expressed by L on the left-hand side. And the result is the analogous inequation, number of results, filter in zero degrees green right, and filter at 30 degrees green left, smaller or equal than the number of results of filter position zero green right, filter position 60 degrees green left, plus number of results filter 30 degrees green right and filter 60 degrees red left. Just, just a formal transfer. But what is all this good for? Well, in the twins, the human twins, the identical twins, our assumption was that the observation of hair color, eye color, and body height was completely independent of where one of them was, whether they were in contact, in touch. You only needed to measure one of them, and it didn't matter. The key characteristics, the three characteristics that each twin had, had been genetically defined. It was in the twin. The 
condition of local reality applied. And it didn't matter what happened to the other because it was identical anyway. And now you can ask yourselves, now how about this? Don't I automatically also have to transfer this to the measurement of the entangled photons? And then you quickly come to realize, well, on the left-hand side, and this is shown by experiments, you have 75% left-hand side, 25% right-hand side, which means the inequation has been violated. Looks pretty harmless. But this finding, French group of researchers did that for the first time in the beginning of the 80s. They proved it for the first time. And this is one of the most dramatic events in the history of quantum physics. Looks inconspicuous, but what are we really showing here? Well, you know, if the assumption of local reality were right, that the two photons that are far apart, that are not even in contact with one another, they can't contact each other, you know, independent of what happens on the one side, there's a certain result on the other, but experiment shows that what happens on the one hand side right depends on what happens on the other side left. There's some kind of a secret correspondence, but it cannot be of a causal nature because it happens at the same time. Causal conclusions, effects, cannot propagate faster than the speed of light. So, and that's the all-important conclusion. Local realism is not correct when applied to entangled photons. There's a relationship, also called correlation, a non-causal correlation. Or, you know, there's non-locality, that's part of it, that's one aspect, and that's what it really means, non-local, non-locality. Two events that happen in different places are related to one another, but it's not a causal relationship. And this means there's a new type of reality which is neither causal nor based on chance, or you know, it doesn't make sense to keep speaking of chance. That would be glossing over the problem. Quantum entanglement, and that's the conclusion, is non-local. Nature is exotic, and quantum theory is right. Here, Einstein errs. With this exotic phenomenon that cannot exist, he wanted to call quantum theory into question. But nature shows this phenomenon. It's a new type of reality. And it's quite harmless. It's hidden in an inequation, but the importance is incredible. And we can certainly ask now, what does that mean for synchronicity and the continuation of the Pauli Jung dialogue? In short, quantum entanglement is the smallest possible form of synchronicity. And you know, I had this quote at the beginning, synchronicity. It could also be a description of non-locality, right? This new type of reality. Zhang and Pauli actually discussed it, saying synchronicity. But here, specifically for photons or particles, 
we consider it quantum entanglement. And of course, there's other questions related to that. This new form of reality, well, in polydong and in entanglement, couldn't it be graphed better? The hard facts of physics have confirmed it. So it's different from before, like Pauli in Hamburg. You couldn't just say, this is just a story. Just a one-time thing. It's not just a one-time story. This is really something new that appears in natural science, which doesn't mean that the contents and the consequence of this new reality has fully been understood. But it does mean that this new reality cannot be ideologized away anymore. And the questions that crop up in the Pauli Zhang dialogue, they have to be asked again, and they need to be updated. And of course, it's still a long ways to go from the entanglement of two particles into the synchronicity of psychic and material processes. Basically, you can use two approaches. One would be developing photon or particle entanglement into more complex structures. But you could also assume right away that basic properties such as non-locality are used as a definition. And then you look at similar structures. As far as I understand, Mr. Pop and his students and Quantica are trying to do research in both directions. So that's one of the few points where they're really working on this issue. And in discussions, I also was told that they feel they're only just getting started. But I think this is a very exciting development that's happening. Just because, like I said, quantum physics is backed up by experiments here, too. And there's an interesting experiment carried out by an American. Dean Rudin, and maybe some of you have already read Entangled Minds, his book, which unfortunately hasn't been translated into German. But Southern, he actually describes an interesting experiment here. And instead of the two uh, photons, the entangled photos, we take two persons, two subjects, who are in separate cells. And uh, these people will have to answer certain questions. And uh, that uh, was, among other things, published in this book. We have two subjects here, a telepathic experiment, by the way. Two uh, subjects, Jack and Jill, sit in two separate uh, soundproof, electronically shielded rooms, and they have a monitor in front of them. They have two packs, two decks, uh, with three identical images, and then a, a random procedure is used to select a picture, and uh, uh, Jack gets one, Jill gets uh, another one um, on the monitor, so that both see pictures at the same time. And they decide um, whether they see the same picture as the other one or whether they are seeing different pictures. And then they signal their decision uh, to a machine. This experiment is repeated about 1,000 times. And the result? Well, both. Well, of course, uh, there is the random probability, and um, Ra Jack and Jill would, uh, of course, answer 50% of the cases with um, yes, or 50% with no. Yes, we're seeing the same. No, we're not seeing the same picture. But in those cases uh, where they have the same picture in front of them, their answers coincided at a percentage of 77%.
Well, if uh, it was just random, if it was just coincident, it should be just 50%. And that is a phenomenon that is typical of uh, entangled photons. So uh, this is where a fundamental property appears which is typical of entangled photons. And uh, that has been proven by telepathic uh, experiment, a very interesting problem. And we can only hope that more research will be done in this field. Because at least uh, there are some aspects here of a synchronistic event. I wouldn't uh, go on to claim that uh, it might be possible to deal with paranormal phenomena. I don't think there's a, a quantum uh, a physical test for that. Now, having said that, this is uh, a, not only a new method of classical physics, it's also a new way of thinking, which goes beyond of our current concept of reality. It's not only the entanglement, synchronicity, uh, non-causal relations or correlations. Um, the point is that quantum physics enters a new element of openness. And that changes uh, the scientific way of thinking about nature. This is not a closed system. In fact, this system is open. And it is only a part of the system uh, that we'll be able to perceive. The non-causal uh, relationship, as we see it in entanglement, is, however, a methodically and experimentally provable part of this reality. Pauli and Young uh, felt that this synchronicity was a universal building block of the new reality, and they tried to find concrete examples. They were aware of the large uh, gap that existed between synchronicity with uh, natural law, general characteristics, and the gestalt unique forms of synchronicity as it is reflected in spontaneous events, first and foremost. In analogy, in animalistics, there's uh, the difference between macro psi and uh, micro psi events, and uh, some are easier uh, to access than others. But I'll be brief on that. But uh, this new definition of uh, reality is a big challenge for both uh, the humanity as, and uh, the natural sciences. The deep insights of the Pauli Young dialogue should, in combination with quantum entanglement and uh, a more generalized uh, quantum theory, as it is being attempted by Atmansbacher, Römer, and Wallach, should play or gain a new importance, and that at various levels. One is uh, the definition of life as seen in biology. Paul, you wrote an essay, the uh, piano lesson, piano lesson, which is printed uh, in the anthology by Atma Hansbacher et al. He had suggested in uh, the piano lesson um, to base uh, the evolutionary process not only on mutation and selection, but also to take synchronicity into account. That was his proposal. Uh, the notion of convergence introduced uh, by the paleobiologist Conway Morris into evolutionary theory uh, can also uh, be understood in this sense. But it is first and foremost the stormy development of neurobiology that uh, should carefully listen uh, to Pauli and other quantum physicists, as well as uh, to um, the groundbreaking ideas of C.G. Jung. So in conclusion, uh, the question remains to photons 
And I hear that a lot of research is done on that, and uh, there are enough experts in this group who can report on that. I lay great store by the development, the application of quantum entanglements as a result of the Paul Young dialogue. Now, I think that will really uh, be able to drive uh, the development of knowledge, and I think quantity will also uh, quite uh, considerably contribute to that. Thank you very much.